I'm online, George. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 133rd New Social Environment. I am Nick Bennett, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Laurence Descartes and Helen Lee and Joaquin Pissarro. We are also thrilled to have the poet Isa Guzman here, who will read to close out today's program. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Leni Lenape, Canarsi, Shinnecock, and Muncie peoples. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manahata home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprising continuing, continuing to unfold, apologies, across the country, following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyn Salau, and in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our hosts for the day, please join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you all. And now without further ado, I will hand the conversation over to today's hosts, Rail Board member Helen Lee and Rail Consulting Editor Joaquim Pissarro. So I hand the mic over to both of you now, Helen and Joaquim. Good morning, Nick. Very nice to be your, your host today. And Helen, nice to see you too. We have the immense pleasure of uh, having Laurence, Laurence Descartes with us today, as you, as you mentioned. Um, if you, uh, if you don't mind, then Helen, I know that we, we have discussed uh, various uh, questions and it's a really wonderful situation, a wonderful opportunity to have you, Laurence. It's, you are uh, heading, you, know, the, you are the president of one of the most important art institutions in the world. Uh, you have uh, uh, gone through, as every museum director, uh, considerable challenges. And you just over the, a few weeks ago began to reopen the, the museum to, to the public. Um, could you tell, take us a little bit through how this has been, how this is going on, and how, what kind of challenges you continue to face within this very good news on the whole? Hello, hello to everyone, and, and thank you, Joachim, and, and, and all the uh, Brooklyn team uh, behind this. Um, this words, yes, about the situation. You know, we reopened at the end of June in, uh, in Paris. We were one of the first main institutions to reopen uh, with, uh, after, just after the Chateau de Versailles, actually. Uh, and we reopened with, uh, with exhibitions, actually, uh, but uh, we postponed, basically, uh, the Tissot, the James Tissot exhibition, and uh, another one uh, dedicated to a rather unknown artist called Chauveau. Um, and uh, they help us, you know, go through the summer, you know, with a, a small attendance, of course, because we control the number of visitors for, uh, because of a sanitary situation. But it, it's been a reasonable, good, uh, reasonably good attendance during the summer. And, uh, and we just uh, closed the show and we just opened in Orangerie because I am... Uh, as you know, leading the both museum, uh, a Giorgio de Chirico exhibition, beautiful Giorgio de Chirico that we managed to save, you know, during the pandemic and we, that we postponed also, and we just opened it. And we are preparing right now for the fall season in a very complex uh, situation. I must, I must share that with you because, uh, you know, we, we're dealing with, uh, in a very, with uncertain times, you know, basically. So it's, it's pretty tough, you know, to know exactly what the next day will be made of. So we're, we're trying to be, you know, as optimistic as possible, but that as we are permanently, you know, making scenarios, you know, options, uh, you know, I spend my time with option A, B, C, D, you know, uh, and as any museum director or, you know, 
leader of any cultural institution uh, around the world right now. So it's a uh, it's pretty hectic time still. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, you know, we have to go through this, uh, and we, we'll see, you know, what happened in the fall. You know. Yeah. So for for our audience, and I, I know maybe Helen wants to, to to join in as well and, and ask a few questions. But it's it's important to understand that you are the president of the Musée d'Orsay and of the Musée de l'Orangerie. Absolutely, but, absolutely. We, so maybe well, we can show uh, an image that show, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the both institutions. Uh, we, we have a yeah exactly uh, we, we, we have uh, the so you recognize the, 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 the iconic image of Orsay you know this museum that was uh, uh, created in a former uh, railway station uh, and opened in 1986 in December 1986 which was really uh, quite quite uh, you know statement at that time and it was a very important moment in thing I think in the modern museum and you recognize also in a in a very uh, I don't know Kubrick uh, Stanley Kubrick aesthetic uh, a photograph of the Nafia what it is by Monet the extraordinary last almost like the testimony of Monet uh, in Orangerie uh, it's one of the, the things that you can see in Orangerie. We have a new display of a, of, a, of a collection. Maybe we can show another slide that will show you maybe uh, new images. So you have a new display that we reopened in Orsay last year, in fall uh, 2019, uh, with the post-impressionist collection with Gauguin and, and Van Gogh as you can see on, 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 on the left side of, the, of, of your screen. And on the right side, the new display of Orangerie that we just reopened uh, with a Curico exhibition, giving a larger place uh, space to um, African collection of Paul Guillaume, who uh, was the dealer and collector who was the, you know, whose collection is the original core of the Orangerie collection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that um, Helen wants to ask you a question about the, your interest in the pre-Raphaelites, but I would like maybe to, to frame this question that Helen will, will pose to, to begin by asking you how you came, you are, uh, and I know you're... Uh, well, Joe Kim, do you mind if I just say hello? No, please, well, of course, I beg your pardon, Helen, absolutely. I thought Thank you, you so much for uh, joining us because uh, as you know, it's been a difficult time for us as well. Our museums are just opening now. So it's yeah. so exciting to see and these celebratory images of, of your reopening. Mm -hmm. um, and to uh, say, we are unable to go to Paris, but this feels very special nevertheless. Yeah. So <laughs> we're so grateful that you've been able to find this time during your very busy ske schedule to join us. No, you're um, welcome. You're welcome. One one thing before we go move on away from these images, though, is something that I find very interesting and something that um, Laurence, I imagine you've been a big part of, is the big governmental support that's been happening there um, during the pandemic. It's a little bit mm -hmm. different from our situation here, mm -hmm. in that um, you've had very little or no uh, layoffs, I believe. Um, no, we, we have no layoffs at all. Uh, no, this is a, well, it's a whole different tradition, uh, um, uh, cultural and political tradition, you know, um, from, from the States. I mean, it's really, um, it, this is the highly centralized vision, you know, of culture in France that dates back to monarchy, basically, and that the Republic uh, regime has, in a way, uh, continued, you know, and uh, we are a state-owned museum. We are a state-owned collection. This collection can be cannot be deaccessioned. This is impossible, uh, strictly legally speaking, impossible. And uh, and we we uh, are connected to the Minister of Culture, you know, in France. Um, I am, for instance, as the president of the both museum, I am appointed by the president of the Republic, you know. Uh, so it, in, in, and it's the case for the president of the Louvre, of Versailles, of the Centre Pompidou. So it means that the state is, is really, in a way, controlling uh, those large uh, institutions. 
and means that the collection, the buildings belongs to, to the states. And that, of course, the state is helping, uh, you know, on a regular basis, those institutions, uh, though it has given a lot of autonomy to, to, to those museums, it is still helping and we receive uh, um, a, a grant every year for the government. And what happened this year is that, of course, with the uh, gigantic, you know, trauma that happening with the pandemic, uh, the state decided to grant special, um, you know, uh, grants and help uh, to those uh, national institutions. So we have a, a special grant for this year. We will have another one for next year that has just been decided by the government and we will be helped also. We already know that for 2022 uh, um, at a smaller level because, of course, everyone hopes that will be emerging at that time from the pandemic. So I've been negotiated uh, those grants with our successive Minister of Culture because we had a change of government in the early part of the summer. And this is part also my job, you know, is to uh, be in contact with, with the government, with our highest political authorities also in France in order to to share the projects, to share our vision, and also to make sure that we can be helped from time to time for certain projects. And that also we, and that could be interesting for a further point in discussion, that we are also uh, a Republican institution. It, it means that we, uh, in a way, um, we reflect the value of a French Republic, you know, that, that, that could be interesting also because it's, it's a point of probably the difference uh, with the United States and some American institutions. No, I think we should probably say, sorry, Laurence, when you say Republican in this country, it carries a different connotation. Uh, I know, I know, <laughs> I am aware. <laughs> You mean that you're a child of the Republic, as opposed yes, to... Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It has no yes. political color, you know. Republic, Republic is neutral in France. Yes, yes. Mostly yes. neutral. I was going to say that it just brings to point the importance of the museums, both the Musée d'Orsay and the Orangerie, and your role in the broader cultural agenda yeah. uh, that yeah. is the whole of, yeah. the uh, of France. And I, I think, Helen, you're absolutely right. And I think it's, a, it's an amazing vote of confidence in a, in a sense, right, uh, Laurence, uh, on the part of the... Of, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, uh, it's a great... No, it's, it's very encouraging that the state is, re and the government is recognizing that culture and uh, museums are part, you know, of uh, the DNA of a nation, of, a, of, a, of our country, and that they are also part of the economic life also, and that they should be part, you know, of this rebirth that is absolutely necessary right now and that culture is not, is not something that comes at the end, you know, when we have mm -hmm. time and money left, you know, it is something that should be at the center of our preoccupation, which is, of course, not a, 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 so easy, you know, to, uh, to accept for some people, as you, you know, rightly say hospitals are much more important right now or medical research or whatever, you know, and that, you know, you're, you're, that's very nice, you're a large museums, but maybe that's not the priority, you know, and it's and good I, to hear that it's still somehow a priority too. Yeah, and I think a very symbolic uh, decision on, on that, that was very obvious from the, the present, your present president, Macron, is that he decided to have a, a, a very important summit. Uh, I think it was with Putin and uh, I forget who else uh, mm. at, at uh, the Chateau de Versailles. And, and yeah. Ors, he's, been, he's been to Orsay several times. He made three, three very symbolic gestures. When, when he was uh, just elected, you know, the, the night he was elected, he gave us his inaugural speech in the Louvre. Wow. In, the Cour, uh, in the Cour Napoleon of the Louvre, mm -hmm. which of course was uh, extraordinary uh, because it's a symbol of monarchy and also it's a symbol of what Mitterrand has done for culture because he was in front of a pyramid, you know, the entry of the Louvre. And I must say, as a museum director and other colleagues of mine had the same reaction, I feel, you know, really happy that they just saying, God, so for once we have a president that that his first reflex is to go to the Louvre. So that's mm -hmm. that's not bad, you know. But uh, and then he, he uh, yes, he, he met Putin um, uh, with Putin in, in Versailles a few weeks afterward, which was quite a, a clever gesture. And he gave uh, uh, for the century um, uh, anniversary of the end of First World War. 
uh, a state dinner with uh, 60 head of states in Orsay, actually. Wow. Uh, wow. In November, in November uh, you know, uh, t t uh, 18. So it was a quite, quite a memory, very strong memory for mm -hmm. me because I was just, uh, I had received a phone, a phone call from the Elysee uh, about uh, two weeks before the, 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 you know, the dinner. And it was the time where we had this wonderful Picasso Blue and Rose exhibition oh. that you know of, Joaquin. And Macron was so enthusiastic about the show that he said, I want to share this with the head of states, you know, because this is what France is about, you know, which is interesting in a way, you know, uh, in terms of cultural diplomacy and... Mm. Uh, and, and you had two weeks to get ready for this small event. Yeah, well, they've done all the jobs. You know, they are, you know, they are efficient people in, in Elysee. You know, I didn't prepare the dinner, hopefully, for the uh, head of states. You know, we had three chefs in the cuisine of Orsay. So it was a battle of French chefs. You know, uh, it was almost like Ratatouille, you know, uh, film of the Disney film. But uh, it was a quite a nice moment, I must say. <laughs> so... Perhaps we can talk a little bit about, Laurence, your background and yeah. what, what all the things that have brought you to this moment of this very difficult crisis moment in your role as both a stateswoman and a museum CEO and president and all the things that um, have added to your illustrious career so far. Um, well, uh, it's difficult to talk of yourself, you know, and to introduce yourself. And it's not my best point, I must say, but, uh, uh, you know, I come from um, uh, quite a privileged background, I must say. I come from a very old family in France, um, and some aristocratic background, I'm afraid. And, um, but, um, but, you know, I've been very lucky to, to have uh, wonderful parents, grandparents that were, uh, very much connected to to the to the literary world. I have a, my one of my grand um, um, parents, my grandfather was a writer, a novelist, a very popular novelist at that time in France, um, and uh, a very funny man that I, I loved very much. Uh, very free man, you know, and um, I have very strong personalities, I must say, in my family. My father is an historian and was, has been a journalist also. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we have a, we have a, we had a thing with literature and history in the family. So it probably had an influence on me somehow, I must say. And my, my, my father and, and mother probably had the very bad idea to bring me as a little girl to the castles of Ludwig II of Bavaria when I was probably seven or eight years old because my, 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 my father wrote a book on the, on the king, on the bad king, you know, on Ludwig. And uh, I thought it was so wonderful, perfect taste, you know, pure <laughs> 19th century craziness. And I thought, this is great. And it probably, you know, <laughs> completely traumatized me. <laughs> Plus living in the center of Paris in a very Kaibot district, you know, uh, when I was uh, going to school, I, every day I used to work on the Pont de l'Europe and the Pont de l'Europe for people familiar with Kaibot works is, is at the center of a, of a Paris world of Kaibot of Manet too. Uh, so every day I used to cross this, uh, this extraordinary uh, place in Paris and I very much enjoy the Osmanian part of Paris. And I, 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 I was born in Paris and raised in Paris, I must say. So I'm a pure Paris product, I'm afraid also. And um, so the whole thing probably ended up with somebody who uh, uh, was very interested with history, archaeology too. At one point I thought I was becoming, I will become an archaeologist, but uh, it, it, it stopped somehow. And, uh, but I knew er very early on that I will, will work in the art world. That, that, was, that was sure, you know, that was absolutely sure. The only thing that I completely excluded was the museum world, which of course <laughs> was probably a mistake, but that somehow, you know, I didn't see myself as a curator because I, this world was very far from me. Um, uh, it was a very closed world, very, very elitist world. And I, I never thought that I, you know, would end up in that, in that world. And I just happened to meet the right people, you know, and I think that's, that's one of the great lessons in life is that 
you know, there are the, the studies that you can make, and I, I study of the Sorbonne, of the Ecole Duve, and everything, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, they are the academic side of things, and they are the meetings, you know, the people who one day say, but Laurence, you should think of, you know, maybe uh, try to pass uh, this very special exam that you pass in France to become a curator. And uh, it's what happened, you know, and uh, in the early part of the 1990s. Um, and um, it's how I, I, I became a curator after, I, I, after you know, a very short experience in the museum world, but that was quite decisive, I must say. And I was very happy to, in my, I was, uh, my first job was to be appointed in Orsay, actually, in uh, the mid-90s as a young curator. And I was very fortunate to enter my professional career at the time where Henri Loiret was becoming the director of the Musée d'Orsay. And that was really very important in my career because I learned everything that I know, professionally speaking, I learned it with, with Henri. And for those, and Joachim knows very well Henri and knows very well what is behind this uh, very important name in the French museum world. Uh, you know, I probably uh, build a vision for my own exercise, you know, professional uh, vision, um, which is not something that is uh, a pure academic vision, but something that is open, that, 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 that takes into account everything that you can do in a museum, uh, you know, and all the possibilities of a museum, all the problems also that it brings, uh, all, all the, uh, you know, the, what, but, but a very open and dynamic vision of things, you know, and uh, uh, so it was, it was key for me because it was really the formative years uh, that I spent uh, you know, with Henri and a whole generation of young curators who happen to be uh, now, at some of them, at the head of uh, many French institutions. You know, I, I became a curator, I have the same promotion as Laurent Lebon, who is now the president of the uh, Musée Picasso, or Sophie Mackay, who is the president of the Musée Guimet. So uh, it's very interesting to see this whole generation now, uh, you know, in responsibility with, with you know, and working for museums that we, we have been, you know, educated with, basically, professionally speaking. So uh, it's also a family story, in a way, another family story, but uh, museums are dysfunctional families, I can tell you, <laughs> but they are families none the way. So, so uh, uh, it's definitely um, something important to say. Yeah. And so for, for our readers, Laurence, I'm going, going to say that, uh, we were fortunate at the rail to be able to interview the three uh, ex-directors, president of the Louvre, mm. including Lo uh, Loiret after leaving Orsay, became the president of the Louvre, succeeding yeah. Pierre Rosenberg, and who succeeded uh, the great Laclotte. And you find all three interviews online. I just want, want to, to throw this. But, but I know one question, Laurence, we, we were, um, Helen and I, very interested to, to ask you. I mean, you have, you're focusing here on your extraordinarily impressive early curatorial career. I, I thought you had started with, with Françoise, but no, you started with on the... On no, the... I, I met briefly Françoise, actually, Françoise Cachin, mm -hmm. but I was... Uh, yes. I, 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 she actually appointed me for, uh, you know, Orsay, before I was leaving for, uh, for New York uh, for a couple of months at the Met with Gary Tintero uh, as a trainee, you know, it was the, 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 the end of my training as a, as a French curator and I had a wonderful time in New York at that time. And so I left Paris with Francois Cachin and say, okay, so when you get back to Paris in July, we start working together, this is fantastic. In the office, she said that in the office, I am sitting right now. Yeah, talking to you. So wow. it's very moving, actually. Yeah. And uh, and when I came back in July, she left. She was leaving, actually, Orsay, as you know, uh, Joaquin, to become directrice des Musées de France. And Henri became the uh, the director. So um, that was so effectively, it. effectively, you worked with all three, with a founding president, François Cachet. Yeah, 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 a little bit. With, a little bit. with whom you're still... Yeah. Henri and, and Cojoal, you worked with all yeah, three. Yeah, yeah, of course, with Guy also, another, uh, yeah, yeah, my predecessor here. So, no, no, I mean, it's, um, <laughs> there's a lot to tell. <laughs> I know that Helen and I were curious to know, to see your, your career is, in fact, equally curatorial as it is directorial. And as we know, it's not yeah. easy to go from one to the other. 
you are not only uh, the, the president of the most, one of the most uh, important museum institutions right now, but you've also been the founding director of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, and you were the director of the Musée de l'Orangerie uh, in, in beforehand, if, I, if I'm uh, correct. How, how can, can you take us through this uh, uh, very unusual uh, professional itinerary? Yeah, uh, maybe we can, we can have a, an image or two of, of the Louvre Abu Dhabi uh, project. So uh, I was a very happy curator in Orsay. Uh, and uh, one day, uh, it was in, uh, in 2007, in March 2007, um, there was a, a huge discussion in France and across the Atlantic about uh, the announcement of a, of a diplomatic agreement between France and United uh, Arab Emirates about the creation of what was going to be called Louvre Abu Dhabi. It was, um, this is an extraordinary moment in the history of uh, modern museums. And the thing was welcome in France in a pure scandal pure scandal. I mean, with the rest of France, you know, you know, it was a kind of revolution uh, inside the museum world. There was a petition uh, um, going around the main museums uh, here in Paris, you know, against the signature saying that the Louvre has, has, has sold, is sold for, you know, for millions of, uh, of euros. And it was very, a very violent moment. And I was uh, in my office in Orsay, working quietly on the Courbet, a large Courbet retrospective at Faubourg Grand Palais. And that went to the Met also, that we did with Gary also. And I received a phone call from, um, from the secretary of the assistant of Henri Loiret, who was the president of the Louvre, who has just signed the, this agreement. And he, he wanted to talk to me directly, which was quite unusual because it is a very busy schedule. And he just said to me, Laurent said, do you have five minutes to come to my office just across the, uh, the, the Seine? Um, you know, if you could make it this afternoon, that would be fine. You know, so you know, and I just said, okay, I cannot say no, of course, to Henri. And I said, my God, this is Abu Dhabi. This is Abu Dhabi for sure. And it was exactly that. He said, uh, you know, uh, I am completely... I am hated. I am the most hated man in the museum world right now. And nobody understands what I am trying to do is to expand a vision, to have a vision for tomorrow. The museum world will not always be about Paris and New York. This is a, this is a global world. This is an expanding world. And this is a time for experience. Also new ways of displaying of new narratives also. Um, and I am doing the Louvre Lens in the French northern province of uh, France. I am creating an Islamic art department in the Louvre, and my third big project will be Abu Dhabi. And I need a new generation of curators to do that, because the curators of the Louvre will, are rejecting the projects. I, I want someone from outside the Louvre, and I want a whole new generation, uh, you know, to uh, have this international experience. And he was very nice to tell me, if you want to be a director one day or president one day, you need to have this kind of, of experience right now. This is going to be tough. You're going to be hated. You're going to be, it's going to be awful, but you will learn uh, what it is to run a museum today and what it is to um, also build bridges between cultures that apparently have nothing in common, you know. And um, so, and I had uh, about uh, you know a day to make my to to, to give my answer. You know, it, it, it was very Loiret uh, thing you know to do. And I knew when I got out of his office that I was going to say yes. Of course, this, this is not to to create a museum from scratch with uh, Jean Nouvel as an architect uh, was yeah. something. You 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 know, I was just forty. I turned forty at that time said, this is, you have to say yes. This is going to be hell, but you have to say that. You cannot say no. So it was hell, a heaven at the same time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would not be the president of Orsay and Orangerie probably today without this experience. And mm -hmm. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot, uh, you know, with this, with this extraordinary project. You see, so you see the building of Jean Nouvel actually, which is, I think, master, the Nouvelle's masterpiece for, for those who have been fortunate to go there. It is an extraordinary 
place. And it's exactly what Nouvelle had in mind, you know, for the museum when, when he designed it in 2007. I mean, the thing that was just open free two years ago uh, is exactly what he had in mind. So it's quite extraordinary. And if you go to the next slide, you will see uh, a vision uh, of, of, the, uh, of the, under the, the dome, you know, this extraordinary Arabic city under the, the dome, this tribute to Arabic civilization, you know, it's like a, it's like a Medina, you know, a sort of cultural Medina. It's like a, a meeting point for east, west, north, south. It's exactly how we, we, we envisioned the, the cultural program for Louvre Abu Dhabi. And you can, can see two works of art that have been acquired for the collection of Louvre Abu Dhabi. I was with my team in charge of the acquisition policy, you know, to create the collection, the basic uh, of the collection. And those two works, you see a Bavarian Christ uh, from Renaissance showing uh, the wounds of Christ. And you see a dancing Shiva also. Those two religious objects were presented to the authorities of Abu Dhabi for acquisition at the first acquisition committee that we organized, you know. And um, I, it was a very bold gesture because, you know, one of the critics that, that went around the project is that people say, you, you will not be able to show mm -hmm. uh, nudities and religious works, you know, that will be censored, you know. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was to prove that Louvre Abu Dhabi was not a place of censorship because censorship is impossible with the name of a Louvre. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a contradiction, you know. And, um, and I said to Henri Loiret at the early start, a stage of a project, we need to, in a very friendly way, to test our uh, friends from Abu Dhabi on their will to go as open culturally uh, speaking and politically speaking as possible. So we should have a, the first commission should only deal with religious works coming from different religions and culture and civilization. So we'll know for sure if they want to go all the way, you know. So we had a wonderful work by Bellini, we had a Buddha head, you know, and uh, those two works were which are now, you can see them in Abu Dhabi, in display, on display in, in Blue Abu Dhabi. But can you imagine um, yeah. an Arabic state buying the uh, wounded uh, Christ? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, know, mm. that, you know, that was a lot of emotion when, when mm. they said, but there's no problem. Of course, this is Blue Abu Dhabi. So go <laughs> ahead, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know. So, so this was... This was a small revolution on the way. I don't think there are many, if, if any, uh, other institution that can compare in terms of diversity. And yeah. I know that Helen and I, but maybe Helen wants to speak up to this more than I, but I mean, I know we, you're also known for having introduced uh, another revolution, which is that when, when you speak to the Louvre Abu Dhabi today, with the exception of Manuel Rabaté, who is the, the director and who is a man, most uh, people are women. And you've done the same thing at Orsay. You are, you are known for having brought in uh, at the top level in this very uh, male-centric institution, all the top executive positions around you at the Orsay are occupied by women, correct? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, but I, I, I wish, yeah, but you know, the first question went Henri back in, in this crazy conversation at the early start when he asked me to join the project and be the curatorial director of the project. The first thing I said to say, but Henri, I am a woman. I am really a French woman, Parisian, <laughs> extremely free. Uh, you know, I am independent. I know nothing about the Arab world, you know, you know, I am old Paris in New York. So, you know, and uh, are you absolutely sure of your choice? You know? <laughs> and he said to me, but well, of course, this is France. <laughs> so, uh, well, okay. So we went ahead and, you know, but about uh, all the ladies and, and wonderful girls who worked on the project and as some of them are still working in Louvre Abu Dhabi, I think it's very important because this, those cultural projects and especially Louvre Abu Dhabi have been a sort of open door, you know, for all this new generation 
that have been generally educated in England, in the States, you know, that are very open-minded, absolutely not the cliche that we have about the Gulf world. Uh, and for those girls, you know, it was a, a, a real way to be independent, you know, and to, and to really uh, create a sort of special status in those uh, new societies also, and very, um, which are a mix of very traditional values and extreme modernity also. So uh, I think that culture was a, a way of, uh, it's a way of freedom also for them. And that was very important. It's not, it's not something that I was really aware, you know, when we were working because, you know, I had a perfectly mixed team, you know, French curators and that, but we realized that, you know, Years after years, we had uh, a lot of young ladies that came with us and are now independent or, you know, having other jobs, you know, in the cultural mm -hmm. world, in that part mm -hmm. of the world, which is, I think, very nice. And it's true that in Orsay and I've been very lucky uh, to be able to appoint a lot of uh, very talented women around me. And I'm very proud of that. I, I'm, 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 I'm not really an activist on that side. I, I prefer the sort of quiet and do things, you know, without uh, proclaiming and making statements all day long. I believe in, uh, in actions, you know, and I think it's so much powerful when you just realize suddenly on the picture, you know, on the photo of the executive team of our Seine Orangery, that women are, the, are at the top, you know, and that's it, mm -hmm. you know, and there's no discussion, you know, there's no debate. It's just, it's done. It's done. Yeah. I think that this might be a perfect segue to um, our next um, topic, which is a show that I know you were very supportive of early on. But first of all, I just want to say, Laurence, it must have been a challenging time, but how gratifying to have such a successful end result. And yeah. just all the critical and public acclaim that's come yeah, from yeah. And, your, and your team's endeavor. So that's very great. That, that it has, has such a happy ending. Yeah. So we're gonna move on now to this wonderful show that actually started here um, in New York um, at the Wallach Gallery at Columbia University. It opened in 2018. It originated from Denise Murrell's 2013 dissertation um, called Mo Posing Modernity, the Black Model from Jericho to Matisse. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of background about your relationship and collaboration with uh, Denise and about the show. Yeah, um, I met Denise when I was uh, director of the Orangerie because I, when I um, uh, came back from Louvre Abu Dhabi experience, I, I, become, I became the director of the Orangerie and um, Denise came um, because she was, she had just been, you know, presenting a, a PhD on, on this uh, question of a black model from uh, Manet to Matisse, actually, that was really the, 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 the exact title. And um, she, she came to me and she said, you know, uh, I have this thesis and I, uh, maybe we could make a show about it for Orangerie to explore this uh, very, place, very special place that has never been explored by academics, you know, of a black model in French painting, in modern French painting. And I immediately said to Denise, but this is dealing basically around Manet, Olympia. This is not for Orangerie, this is really for Orsay. This is, this is a major subject that should be, um, should be uh, really uh, Done in, as an exhibition, but it should be done in 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 uh, you know in Orsay. And I said, you know, Denis, I will probably be a candidate for the presidency of uh, Orsay and Orangerie in uh, uh, you know in a year time. And I promise you that if I become the the next president of those two museums, one of the first thing I will do is to have on the, the exhibition program this this show in a an adapted version, you know, uh, from New York, but I will do it. And it's, it's exactly what happened, but because in between Dennis um, tried to have a show, as you might know, uh, in several major New York institutions that I won't name uh, here, uh, <laughs> but said no, you know, and said this is, this is too, no, this is not a subject, this is too tricky, this is too risky, this is too, you know. 
And, uh, you know, it ended at the Wallach Art Gallery, which is a perfectly uh, nice institution, but a smaller institution, but, but, you know, the one that could have been envisioned for such a subject. And um, when I became president of the uh, Orsay Orangerie, I went to one of my first trips was to New York to, to meet my, my colleagues. And I said, I'm going to take the show that will be at the Wallach, but in a whole new version for, for, for Paris, in an expanded version for Paris. And I remember some of my esteemed and, and friendly colleagues said to me, are you absolutely sure of you? You know, this, this, is, this is, I mean, if you start with this in Orsay, you know. And I said, no, I think, I think it's time. It's high time that we deal with a subject. This is a, this is a silence, you know, there's such a silence on this. It's going to be tricky, it's highly political, it's highly risky, it's as risky in, in France as it is in, in, in the States, in a whole different context, but, but I think we should do that, you know, we really should do. And so we went ahead with a special scientific committee for Paris, where Denis was, of course, and we adapted. And it's, you see the, the title is a bit different because posing modernity is not, you cannot translate that in France. So we, we call it the Model Noir, which is, an ambiguous title on, on the question of a model and from Jericho to Matisse because we expanded a little bit uh, also going to the roots of the abolition in France, which dates back to the French Revolution. It's hence you have Jericho, you know, and we had some wonderful loans from the Louvre actually for, to start the exhibition with. Hmm. And one, one leg, I mean, one, this is fascinating. I, I'm sure that uh, our audience is, uh, as surprised as uh, Helen and I to, to hear those details. But I think one thing that I think very few people know, and I think you're also responsible for this, is that uh, New York, Columbia, and Orsay Langry were only two of the station of the venues of the exhibition. You also organized to send it to the French West Indies. That, that was a French uh, question, you know. I wanted, because you know that our, uh, the, the core of our Black community in France comes from the West Indies, the French way Martinique and Red Loop. And I really wanted the, the exhibition to go there, you know, and not only be a Paris and New York question, you know, that, that could be debatable, you know. And uh, very fortunate we, we had a partner there and there was a third uh, venue, a smaller one, but a very strong one and a very touching one, you know, uh, over there. And I'm very proud of that because uh, it's, it was the first time that a big Parisian institution worked with the French West Indies, you know, on a major mm -hmm. exhibition project, you know. They had never done that before. So it was a huge collaboration and something that, uh, something to remember, I think, really. And mm -hmm. uh, it was great. It was and great. And so it's not to want to get into the nitty gritty, but I know we have several curators and directors, museum uh, people on our on our um, audience. Yeah. How do you go into? Because as you know, uh, the, I mean better than anyone, the, there's all these facilities reports, these technical conditions for for lending uh, outside loans that are required. Were, were the conditions uh, required uh, met in, uh, in the museum? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, it was a modern building, but they made. Uh -huh special renovation for the exhibition because we I were see. very demanding, of course, and, and we said, if you want international loans, you need to, mm. uh, of course, uh, have uh, some renovation done, but it was done. I mean, it was, mm. uh, so it was a very, no, no, it was a quite, um, quite a moment. <laughs> yeah, well, this is fascinating. And do you foresee that this uh, will now perhaps be a precedent for expanding the, the, the international, uh, itineraries among museums I and mean, with this? Uh, you know, this is, this is the tough question for the moment, Joachim, because we are mm -hmm. in a, such a crisis right now that uh, any question surrounding international collaboration is tricky for the moment, I mean, whatever the place, you know. So it's, you know, we, we have to get back to a certain normal uh, life in order to, uh, to do that. But I am a strong believer that, you know, works, works of art should travel Mm -hmm. That is nothing, nothing beats the real experience of facing, I mean, the actual work. It's exactly what Louvre Abu Dhabi is about. It's not about a digital experience. It's about bringing masterpieces from French collection there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's not the same when you're facing the real Manet, the real Leonardo da Vinci. That's, that's a whole different experience. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that, you know, it would be a very sad world if works were, you know, kept uh, 
uh, in uh, you know in, in never travel, never go out of museums. Uh, but that that would be very very sad. Uh, we should be careful about that traveling. We should take all the uh, precautions. But I think that you know. In the history of the world, I mean, works of art have traveled all, always and have circulated, and I think that that that's really part also of the world history. Yeah. yeah. So I I know we have some very interesting images around the show and some of the great programming that you were able to do. Um, yes. Yes. But before we leave, I think we would all be bereft. You have just said that seeing a work is not the same as experiencing it digitally but we do have one piece from the show and I'm just imagining the West Indies and seeing, having the audience there, see the work of Manet and Olympia in person. And um, I just wanted well, to remind- I have to say that Olympia didn't make the travel to, uh, uh, that, that would have been too much because Olympia is not, cannot leave or say, uh, it's, 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 it's really complex, legally speaking. And for insurance reasons, that would have been, that, that was too much. So Olympia stayed in Paris, but um, a lot of important masterpieces from Marseille went to the West Indies. But you're, you're, you're right. I mean, this was in Paris at the center uh, of the exhibition uh, because it's uh, where the, I think the, the, the real purpose of a show um, lays is that, you know, we all know Olympia. We are all familiar with this extraordinary work. And uh, we all tend to concentrate, as, as all the artists in, has ever done with this work, on the body of Victorine Meurant, you know. And tons of books have been written about, written about uh, um, Victorine's nudity. And, and the symbol of it, what it means, the, all the maybe secrets that are behind uh, the works. And nobody paid any attention to the black servant. To, and uh, one of the great merit of, 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 of Dennis was, was to explore, you know, this figure. Uh, and we know now that she's called Laure, she has a name. Um, and that, uh, you know, Mané mentioned uh, the name of Laure in one of his notebook that was exhibited in the exhibition close to the, um, to, 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 the, to the picture. And the idea of a show, I used to say to journalists, you know, the, the show was you, that you'll never look at Olympia the way you looked at it before, because you will um, rebalance the way you look at the work and you will see the interaction between Laure and Victorine, and you you will question what what Manet had in mind, you know, um, beyond the tribute to classical painting and to Venetian painting, there is something that is telling about modern Paris, the black community of modern Paris at that time, uh, and. Uh, the quite recent abolition question, um, Manet was a Republican in the French sense of the world. He, 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 he was, uh, uh, you know, he was not a political artist, but something very, somebody very aware of the political ideas of his time and had uh, strong ideas about politics. And of course, you cannot see this subject without connecting it to the French political history of that time, you know, um, and and the Parisian context. But I discovered myself, you know, uh, going through the archives research that we started with the exhibition in the uh, Ecole des Beaux Arts, with the registers, you know, of all the black models mixed with the white models posing for the painters of that time, with the addresses, the name, the addresses in Paris, so we can have a map of the black Paris of that time, you know? And that was fascinating because it was a whole new uh, Paris emerging, artistic Paris also connecting to, to, to the art world, to the night mm -hmm. world, also to the prostitution also. Um, and that was very fascinating. So the, the exhibition in Paris brought a lot of new material. And I mean, the, the catalog is a huge publication with tons of new information that will I think dates now, you know, make a, it's an important statement, you know, and everybody working on, on the subject right now 
uh, we'll have to go back to this exhibition probably to criticize this also, but, but, but it's, a, it's a landmark, you know, in, yeah, in art yeah. history. I don't think there'll be very much criticism. As a result of the show, I just wanted to say Denise Murrell, who was a Ford Foundation yeah. fellow, um, is now at the Met. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. With Max Holine at the Met. So um, the yeah. story continues. Yeah. Beyond yeah, absolutely. I'm very happy for, for, for Dennis. Yes, yes, yes. And I think that there's probably one, one more uh, string to, to what you were discussing again, Laurence, that through your uh, very early on, I, I did not realize it was, the, it was before you were actually appointed as the president of Orsay that you decided to go with the show, that had this show not happened, it, um, I don't know whether Denise would be where she is now. Uh, it would be interesting to ask her what she thinks. But, uh, so, yeah, you should ask Max, Max Oline, maybe. <laughs> No, it's a very, very important <laughs> point. So I just wanted to go move and show some of the great programming, Laurence, that we yeah, yeah. Had the show. Uh, one of, yeah, we had a lot, tons of events, as you see, uh, including performing arts, music, uh, you know, uh, theaters and uh, dance. And it was fantastic with a whole new audience coming to um, to Orsay probably for the first time, you know, uh, and it was a joy. I mean, uh, uh, you, you have to see that there was absolutely no incident during the uh, almost four months of the exhibition, you know. Uh, the press was quite, you know, very happy with the show, but I mean, the, the audience and so, and it, you have to know that you're on risky territory, you know. We were definitely out of our comfort zone during the show, but I strongly believe that uh, if you want to expand the, uh, you know, the cultural scope of the visitors of a, the of a museum, you have to, you can make a change through programming and, uh, and dealing with subjects that are dealing with history. We are historical museums, you know, the collections of all say are 19th century basically, but we look at those works with today's sensitivity uh, and, uh, and history. And we need to make a connection with the public of today and those um, earlier works, you know. And from time to time, I want my, the, the both museums to engage with subjects that are dealing with uh, questions that are really relevant for today's society, you know. And that is exactly what the, the Black Model and all those wonderful artists that, you know, when I approach those wonderful artists, you know, uh, uh, they all said, this is wonderful, uh, this is, but you, you're, this is risky also, you know, all the, those black artists saying, you know, this is, this is going to be a bumpy road and everything, but actually it went very smoothly and it was very interesting because, uh, you know, we also have some VIP visitors during any exhibitions and I had almost all the classic, uh, the, the, the political, you know, scope without the two extremes, left or right. But the middle, you had all sensitivities, political sensitivity, and they all came to see what was happening in Paris, saying this is, this is amazing that a French institution can do that. And it was very, very interesting. So we were very lucky, you know, and that, that's also my spirit, you know, for the programming of us is that it's not only about works of art, paintings and sculpture and photography, or whatever, it's about music, it's about dance, it's about theater, it's about contemporary artists. And we had a wonderful experience of working and commissioning a work to Glenn Ligon also. Yeah. This is wonderful. Uh, and you know that our contemporary art programs are uh, curated by Donna Siangro, a good friend of us, uh, Joachim. And um, Donna Sien approached um, Glenn and we were so, you know, proud and happy that he accepted in a very, very short time to imagine um, a gigantic, I mean, say, work for the show. Because, you know, we, we, we were dreaming of a sort of statement in the central nave of Orsay that would put the name of the models, you know, of the black models on the walls of Orsay during the time of the show. So you, you can see a small clip of that, of the installation of the work of them. It's yeah. Definitely, it's from 2019. It's a very celebratory and uh, the work is monumentally scaled and we can take a look and see what, what, how it finished, what the end product was.
very wonderful, moving. Wonderful memory. Wonderful. Yeah. Memory. Yeah. And, and so maybe you, you, you might want, uh, Laurence, to, to uh, give a little context to our audience because, um, you know, Glenn Ligon, uh, the Orsay Musée, Musée d'Orsay, it's not a natural choice. But in fact, this is part of a program that you've introduced as well, whereby you give voices to present living, not necessarily French, um, uh, several Americans, but international contemporary artists who intervene in your collection, isn't that right? And yes, please. Yes, I, I do. Uh, I do think that you know, a museum should be open and or, and open to all and to artists, of course. And uh, I do think that we need, you know, we, in order to have this uh, uh, the feel of today and sometimes tomorrow, because artists are generally completely ahead of us in terms of vision, you know, and uh, the way they sense things. And I do think that it's always interesting to have discussion with people who have a different vision, not an academic vision, uh, you know, they bring something different to the collection or to an exhibition projects. And uh, so we, 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 we have this, this program that is funded by uh, our American friends of Orsay and Orangerie, and I really want to, to thank them. I, I know that some of them might be connected right now to our program, but uh, uh, thanks to their generosity, we are able to organize invitation in Orsay and Orangerie, uh, of contemporary artists, and it's 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 a treat. I mean, it's wonderful because it is something that changes your vision. You know, you 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 know a, a subject, an artist, academically, curators are very good. I have you know wonderful graduate team who know a lot about our collections, or the subject we are treating. But what an artist bring is something completely different. There's a new dynamic, and uh, and I think it's completely. You can have this historical accuracy and, 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 and demand, you know, you should be very demanding about the historical accuracy of what you're doing because you're dealing with important subjects, important artists, and also the freedom of inviting, of opening doors, windows, imagining crazy things, you know. When I said to Glenn, I see something on the two towers, I remember uh, Glenn saying something like, uh, holy shit, you know, <laughs> like you're not doing art. God, but you are you crazy? You know? <laughs> and uh, sorry for my French, but that but, but was about the, uh, the first reaction. And I said, yeah, I think that we should, we, for this thing, we should be monumental, making a statement, you know, something strong, you know. Hmm. And it's extraordinary because uh, weeks after this conversation, he sent the first, you know, um, uh, draft of a project and it, everything went very, very quickly. And he got it perfectly right. I mean, the scale of the thing was perfect, which is not an easy thing because this is a huge space, you know, as you know, yeah. and it's, it's a tough, a tough one. And right now we are in the middle of developing a little bit of a project of the same size, a video project with Laurent Grasso, French artist, uh, a video for, uh, that will accompany our next big exhibition uh, called The Origins of the World. And, uh, last week, I was uh, at a screening test of a monumental, gigantic video screen that will be put between the two towers in uh, early November in Orsay to, in order to show the video of uh, of Laurent. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so it's been really thrilling experiences. Mm -hmm. I, we definitely want to uh, hear more about that wonderful show, The Origins of the World, but very yeah. quickly because we have, a, unfortunately, Laurent, you will have to return again for another yeah. episode. No, no. This part two. You don't want this. You before don't want we this. finish um, with the show, in, uh, The Origins of the World, Inventing Nature in the 19th yeah. century. I just it's exactly the same spirit. Uh, we have, I think, a slide maybe that will indicate you a few works that will be uh, hopefully present. Uh, and the videos thing of, of Laurent. Uh, it's exactly the same spirit as the black model in a way, is to take a subject that is uh, the invention of biodiversity, you know, by the science of the 19th century. 19th century is definitely something that is, you know, the, the century of the birth of modern science, of course. Uh, the question of evolution and the Darwin's theories also at the middle of it, and the connection between the uh, history of science and history of art and, and of artists, uh, scientists and artists around the question of the place of man uh, within nature. It's something that I re was subjected to my art that I also started working on when I was appointed president of Orsay and uh, 
hopefully you will see the the, 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 the result in a few in a few weeks. So uh, you see a few works that will be present in the exhibition. Uh, the uh, Gabriel von Max uh, portrait uh, of a monkey, uh, which is of course directly linked to Darwin's uh, theory, and also the extraordinary triptych by Mondrian called Evolution. Um, that will be one of the final works uh, in the um, in the exhibition, and you see the uh, few clips from uh, Laurence Grasso video that he um, that he really created, uh, you know, as a sort of companion of the exhibition. He he knew everything about the historical show, so he really took his ideas, and we had a. We had an ongoing discussion with Laurent for the last three years about something for Orsay, something monumental. And so you're, you're going to see the result in a, in a few weeks. I think it's an interesting show that connects science and art that will pose you know, terrible questions for today. What have we done? Have we destroyed the world we live in? Has this destruction has started really seriously in the 19th century. And at the same time, the 19th century is the birth of ecology and also the knowing of all the speeches and uh, a science museum and modern science and this ambivalence you know of beauty destruction fascination you know will be at the center of the exhibition we have a, a partnership with the museum of natural history in paris that will be lending yeah. extraordinary pieces alongside the art the works of art you know so mm. it's it's quite a show <laughs> so um we'll see we'll see <laughs> And opening in November. In November, in, on the 10th of November, if I remember correctly, yeah. yeah. And pushing well. boundaries that um, connect art, science, mm. um, high mm. environment. Yeah. And the, and the 19th century to today, to, to the 20th century. Yes, century. absolutely. Yes. Burning yes. issues, yes. yeah. As, as, a, as, as a starting moment of our modernity and all mm. the big questions, you know, that are around us today, yeah. So Helen and I were, before we, we finish, and we, I know I'd like to have a, maybe ask Helen to conclude, but we wanted to ask you personally, Laurence, some questions, because you, you, like all of us, you have your own choice, your own preferences, and uh, we were intrigued that Helen pointed out that you, you spent a lot of time and interest uh, on uh, a 19th century group that is perhaps not the most, uh, the reason why one comes to Orsay for sure, the pre-Raphaelites. Would you like to tell us a few things about, about that? Uh, do you mind or? Yeah, I don't know. I have an anglophile no? thing, you know, and I am a, one of the rare curators in France that think that English painting can be interesting. So that, that's, uh, you know, we're not so many on this side of a channel. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate, it was with Henri Noiret when I was a younger curator to create a Burne Jones exhibition for Orsay that we did with the Met and Birmingham. And, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I was always interested by the prayer of her life. So I spent, yes, quite a few, yeah, quite a time on those subjects because I think it's a very uh, bizarre avant-garde movement of the 19th century. It's a sort of very strange, of course, it's, it's English, so it's bizarre, you know, for us, but and so it's fascinating. Uh, and it's a whole different side of modernity that is completely uh, in a way at odd with what was happening in France at the same time, in a, in a very way, it's modernity through the past, you know, through mm -hmm. a sort of archaism, so through, through pureness also, there's a very interesting thing. And the subject is still very dear to me, and I dream of an exhibition that will treat with the, uh, what we call l'enfance de l'art, you know, the purity, this, 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 this uh, in, uh, urge for purer sources in 19th century and early part of the, ninth, of the 20th century for artists. And pre raphaelites are part of that. So it was, uh, mm -hmm. and I still have, um, you know, quite an interest for, for, for them, you know. And it, uh, yeah, yeah, they are ni nice memories too. <laughs> well, I'm just very curious, I was curious about it because I'm always fascinated by their radicalism. You know, yes, yes, yes. Back, but they're very young, idealistic and- Absolutely at the same time. So oh, yes. I thought yeah. that, that was such an interesting connection to make about your career and what you've done with the shows that the where the subjects are, sometimes the themes are surprising and you push boundaries. And I was trying to think about how you were interested in the pre-Raphaelites. So, <laughs> okay. um, 
I just feel like we would be remiss somehow to uh, not mention one other work, but to lead up to it rather, you know, briefly, because it's not yes. the same part yeah. of the show, but to just talk about it briefly, to just, we have here in the States have read, you know, just about an incident, one mm -hmm. of, uh, incident that has happened last week. So it's very yeah. recent of um, a little uh, run-in that one of the uh, people, the young women who come to the Musée yeah. d'Orsay, yeah, 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 had, in, uh, had yeah. a little problem and um, it somehow went, as we call it, viral. Um, mm -hmm. The word has such a different meaning these days, but um, we uh, were very, very interested because it seemed so French to talk about the femen protests going on there. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps, and this was my little juxtaposition here to put the Delacroix, which is at the Louvre, but still uh, an important work um, mm -hmm. to talk about with the imagery yeah, yeah, yeah. inside the Musée d'Orsay. I believe this image is from last weekend. Yeah, last Sunday. It was on Sunday. I was on Sunday. So, well, a quick, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, we, we, you know, a quick word on, on this. No, there was a regrettable incident uh, last week in Orsay. Young uh, woman had uh, trouble getting access. She actually accessed the uh, the museum, but uh, there was a discussion by uh, you know security people who worked outside the museum about the way she was dressed. You know. And uh, that was that's, that that that's really regrettable and absolutely uh, something that should be you know uh, condemned. Uh, uh, very frankly speaking, and I we immediately once we were aware of the incident, we immediately tweeted then you know that we were sorry about the incident, and uh, we called actually we 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 managed to to call and reach the, the younger woman you know who was. Uh, the, the victim of this incident and had a very nice conversation. She's been very, um, you know, uh, nice about it. She was saying that uh, she, of course, made a difference between, uh, you know, the incident and the reality of the Orsay, of Orsay, what we were doing, you know, what we are, the values that we carry. So it's very unfortunate, but it's also something that I think any museum in the world is confronted that it's uh, it's viral it's the social networks you know and uh, people react and their reaction i do not take them you know literally for osse because i know what osse collection is about you know and um, uh, we do not have de la croix but we have the origin of the world of courbet and we have victorine meuron and we have a lot of the very strong, you know, uh, statements in the terms of the freedom, you know, of a women body, you know, and uh, so I, it's. I do not take it, you know, literally. I I, I take it as an incident of in in the, the management of the organization of the museum, and we are working very hard to make uh, this, uh, you know, uh, a, a memory. And, and, and that should not happen again in any way, in any way and, uh, and uh, make uh, you know, everyone to, to understand that uh, you know, this, this should not happen again. Uh, but I think that it says a lot about our time, which is a very you know, uh, sensitive you know, about certain issues, extremely also quick to, to answer, to um, to make quick and, and very strong reactions, which I understand. I mean, it's a very tense moment too. Uh, you, you know, we're all going through a very tough time, collectively speaking, and uh, we all have to understand that everything can start a fire right now. And uh, so I understand what is behind this, and I completely um, try to, uh, you know, to. Um, uh, make sure that it never happens again in Orsay. I will. I will. I didn't want to comment it directly in the media, because I didn't want you know to start a sort of discussion that that could be difficult when when things are very tense. But I will uh, express myself probably uh, uh, you know uh, in a few in a few weeks about this more deeply because uh, what the collections of Orsay, what a picture like this that I was in charge of. Uh, when when it entered the national collection as a young curator, you know, um, are saying is that uh, you know there were artists in the 19th century that 
uh, were really the, um, the the most the freer, you know, of a, uh, a man of our time, and they changed the way we see the bodies of women uh, and uh, we, the representation of the uh, of the of the bodies of women and and. What is happening in our collection is fascinating. Uh, if you compare it to today, you have the traditional uh, way of painting a nude, a female nude, the academic tradition, and you have Courbet, and you have Manet, and you will have also uh, Gauguin. Uh, you know, and those people changed the 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 grammar, the code of uh, um, of the of a representation. And one of the key question is, of course. Uh, the question of the representation of a body, and when I um, when I say that, it's quite a serious matter because you know you can come every day to uh, Orsay and see L'Origine du Monde with a, without any kind of censorship, which is not the case on social media. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect answer. Please do come to Orsay and, and experience the real thing. You'll be completely free, and we were happy to welcome the feminine. Actually, it went very, you know, I. When I left the, my office on Friday night and I, I, we had a meeting about the weekend and we were expecting, you know, uh, maybe some activists coming to the museum, you know, because of the incident. And I said to our security team, you know, the femen will probably come during the weekend. I would not be surprised. So no problem. They, they should be, you know, they should enter. They should do your thing. They're going to do wonderful images. And I, I love, I, I, in a way, I love very much this image. I think it's a very strong one uh, in Orsay. And, um, you know, it went very smoothly and uh, that's it. And we have to work on our side to make, again, this, this uh, regrettable incident uh, um, um, something of the past. But I think that when people um, know a little bit or say the collection, what we are doing, what we've been doing for the last three years, what we're going to do, uh, the women who are in charge of Orsay, because some people were criticizing Orsay, and when they say, but you have a woman at the top of Orsay, and you have women everywhere, so they just uh, say, okay, okay, I didn't know, you know. <laughs> it's, so, yeah, that, but that's, you know, that, that's today's life. You have to, to accept it and, and, and uh, and uh, you know, live with it. You understand completely what the um, sensitivity and the complications are. And I just wanted to bring yeah. the point of showing these images to have you answer so perfectly um, where we are today. And yeah. I, I agree, um, pre raphaelites black models, um, the origins of the world, inventing nature in the 19th century, and so many of the other shows, Abu Dhabi Louvre, that big momentous moment of internationalizing and globalizing the Louvre. These are all very important, momentous, historical um, projects that you have done so well and so successfully. Um, Joe, before we hand it over to questions, is there any? No, I just wanted to, to go, go back to just a word uh, Laurence just said, uh, moving things to the past. And I, I said, go, moving from the past to the future, the, this is actually the title of one of the great books by Hannah Arendt, Between Past and Future, which reverberates with what you're doing, Laurence. Do you want to tell us a little bit to tell our audience? I think you, I'm sure that you will be getting a lot of visitors just from this presentation alone. But what, what are you, how are you envisioning the future close? Uh, and, well, we are, as you know, you are, Joachim, you, we, we are working on a big project called mm -hmm. Orsay Wide Open, which we, we might have a slide of it, you know, with a few images. Uh, yeah, that's a few, few images. Um, uh, with a new installation, actually, of a, a new display of a collection that we started, uh, you know, working on. And um, two, diff two new additions to Orsay, uh, an education center, because I, I do think that you know, our, our kids, our young audience, family visit with families are very central to what we do because there's no sense, you know, of having those large museums, making wonderful exhibitions, if you do not pass to younger generation those heritage, this heritage. And it's not as easy as it looks, you know. I mean, I used to say the modernity of a Gar Saint Lazare painted by Monet is not obvious for a 15 year old today. I mean, this is, this is not obvious, you know. So you have to tell the story to a younger generation. And that's really at the, at the core, you know, of my project. So you, you have a few images of, a, of a, the education center, which is, 
something that you're very familiar in, in the States with, but, but quite, quite new in, in the French context. And I really think that it's going to be a, a wonderful addition to, to the Musée. And what you see also is an image of a future research center that we will uh, implement in, uh, on the Quai Voltaire, uh, two steps from Orsay in a wonderful uh, old building. Um, and uh, we will, uh, we want to be very serious about research, about having programs, you know, international programs, having students, um, you know, and, and teachers from all over the world. Uh, also giving this fresh look to the art history of 19th century and early 20th century. And to just a, being able to translate those new vision, those new approaches like the black model or origins of the world into uh, the collection, the display, the exhibition programs, making connection between research and, and, uh, and the museum. So it's a huge, uh, it's, a, it's a big adventure. We've been very fortunate to have wonderful American support for that. And I want to acknowledge this very special relationship that uh, our museum has with the States. Generally speaking, we, we, we have this wonderful uh, American Friends organization. We have some donors, wonderful donors. And I want to say um, a symbolic hello to probably to, uh, to, Marlene and, uh, to Marlene Hayes and Spencer Hayes, the memory of Spencer who have decided to give their wonderful Nabi collection to Orsay and, and to our wonderful donors. And, and all the collaborations also to all the shows that we co-produce with American institutions, we are one of the French museums that is uh, extremely involved in uh, collaborating with uh, uh, American institution. And I uh, cherish this uh, very special relationship one of my ancestors died for uh, the freedom of America. So we are a family, the Dekar family is Cincinnati, you know, so, um, and I do think that, uh, you know, there's still, whatever the politics, whatever the trouble we're going on both sides of the Atlantic, there's always something special and we work very well together, you know, Americans and French. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laurence. This is an absolutely beautiful way to conclude. Um, Helen, do, would you like to, to add a few words? To yeah, no, I think um, we have just been so fortunate and it's just been so fantastic to hear from Laurence about some of the details of these images and shows that we've all have admired for, for a, a quite some time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Shall we move to um, Nick? Q &A. Are we ready for you, Q &A? Are you ready to take a few questions, Laurence? Yes, 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 of course. Yes, um, thank you everyone for throwing your questions into the chat. I want to first say thank you, Laurence. Thank you, Joachim and Helen, for this wonderful conversation. It's so interesting because it comes after a conversation we had yesterday on curatorial activism. And um, it's just wonderful to see, you know, museums, institutions, and this at the forefront of, of dialogue and conversation because they're so, they're so beloved and so dear to us. And we, uh, I can only hope that our next president appears in his first few days in front of a museum. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and go right into the Q&A right now. Uh, first, we have uh, the Rails own managing editor, Charles Schultz. Uh, Charlie, I believe you can turn on your mic. Yes, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Lorenz, Joaquim, and Helen. It was a, a really very fascinating conversation. And uh, I, I'm glad that Nick brought up yesterday's broadcast on curatorial activism because I was thinking about, I was thinking about that um, throughout this conversation. And my question kind of goes back, back to that. Um, yesterday, uh, Maura Riley, a scholar, critic, curator, um, was discussing the concept of curatorial activism and, and to paraphrase it very briefly, it's uh, the idea of using exhibitions um, or exhibition strategies to be um, explicitly political gestures or phenomenon. And I wonder if this idea, if this concept is present at all amongst the curatorial teams at your institutions or, 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 or not? Uh, strictly speaking, I wouldn't say that we are in curatorial activism. We, 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 are, we are not a contemporary art museum, basically. So we are more dealing with a more historical approach and collection. So uh, you have to take that into account and the scholarly tradition that goes with this. 
and that is very important, you know, to, to preserve. Um, I think also that, uh, in a way, uh, the, the French approach of a museum is a highly political one, you know, also. Uh, and it's inside, I mean, the DNA of any French uh, public museum, national institution, you have the, the whole history of what is a museum inside the modern society. You know that the Louvre was transformed as a museum during the French Revolution. This is the birth of our modern tradition. And uh, Orsay is a sort of, uh, you know, grandchildren, a uh, grandchild of that. And um, as we are a public institution, I think we are very much aware, we are civil servants. I am a civil servant. My curators are civil servants, uh, you know, in France. So we are very much in, um, aware of something that is what we call service public, you know, what a public service, you know, we, we are at the center of a society and we should connect to the society, you know, and um, so it definitely, it might not be activism, maybe the way you, you approach it yesterday, but it's very much present on my mind and this political in the, I mean, noble sense of the term, not, not in, you know, in the narrow sense of the term, this political um, dimension of a museum was very, I, I really experienced it when, when with the Louvre Abu Dhabi project, which was a highly political one. You couldn't get more political than this, you know. And I sense that how much museums, art, works of art, culture, you know, when you're talking about all those subjects are deeply political, deeply political. So we approach it in a, if we have a French, you know, culture and history differently from, from America, obviously. We have some differences, you know, cultural differences. The, the question you're, um, you, you're talking about communities, for instance, you're talking about, you know, you're, you're talking, the museum is, uh, you know, addressing communities uh, in America. This word is impossible in the French official system. You know, we are one and we cannot be divided, you know, so the Republic is one and cannot be divided. So I have to, when I do something like the black model, you know, I have to play on, on a very thin um, ground between the Republican values and something that comes from a lot from American universities and research, which is this a uh, whole new vision, you know, of uh, something that comes from the public, from the people, you know, that react, interact with, with the heritage. And uh, I was very careful when, when I, we, we organized the French venue of the Black Model to be able to, be, uh, to balance the two questions and not to be at all with the Republican values that we, sh we should preserve and I strongly I am very French I must say for that you know I am I am Charlie I am everything you know so there's no question about that um, and I do I do strongly believe that that this is what France is about but also I acknowledge uh, you know that things are changing around us but we should be open to new approaches to new voices and my vision of a museum is also like a bit you know inviting those new voices try and hear the voice. You, you, you can disagree with them. You can, you know, there's no problem. And when the feminine comes to, you know, people, some people are shocked or whatever. I don't, you know, it's, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's perfectly understandable and respectable. You know, you can disagree or agree, but debate, debate is part of what a museum is about. It's a place of freedom, and that I'm very serious about that. That this is this is a tough question right now. You should be able to criticize uh, inside the museum. There's no problem about that. There's no problem. You, but you have to is respect all voices. You know that that's that's and that's tough during those days because you know people tend to you know go very quickly on very too quickly on very serious obvious notions. But I'm very strong on the idea that. You know, all voices are welcome. Uh, maybe not the most extreme one and violent, and of course, you know, you have to suppress a few ones. But but the, all voices are welcome, and a, a contemporary museum should acknowledge those new voices. You know, and and try a new narrative and experience with it. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's pretty obvious. You know. 
Thank you, Lawrence. I really much appreciate the distinctions you made and, and your answer. I, uh, I only wish I could come visit your museum sooner than I'll be able to. Sooner. Soon, soon, <laughs> soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, Charlie and Lawrence. What, what an incredible answer. Um, next, I will pass the mic over to our own Malvika Jolly. Malvika, you should be able to turn on your mic. Just a moment. Malvika, are you Thank there? you, Nick. Yes, yes. thank okay. you. Um, Laurence, I wanted to thank you for what you were just saying. I was very interested in and agree with what you're saying about the French approach to a museum being a very political one. Um, and maybe that leads me to my question uh, that what happens when your curators are civil servants uh, for the nation um, and, you know, have to sort of work in the context of uh, a more global context. So mm -hmm. I guess my, my question is, is more specifically, I would love to hear more about your experiences working with Lufre Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, obviously the Emirates is a former colonial state uh, until very, very recently. And while they were not a French colony, they were part of the British empire. Um, but you know, the French colonial empire is well represented in the Ar Arab world. And you know, as recently as the sixties had relationships with the Emirates in terms of, mm -hmm you know, as a British colony in terms of sort of oil surveys, oil extraction, oil purchase. Uh, so I feel like as with m most, most of the world, the entanglements are deep. Um, and just for context, yesterday we had a curator from a sort of formerly colonial museum and library speaking very honestly about the difficulties of decolonizing colonial institutions um, sort of from within. Uh, and so my question is uh, very openly, um, how do you curate and program and hire and head a museum like the Louvre Abu Dhabi, but also the other institutions you've headed um, while being sensitive and politically accountable for the reality of sort of France's previous political relationships in the region, uh, in the Arab world, and sort of what that represents. You know, you are Miss France, um, as you sort of jokingly said, uh, you know, can you share some experiences from what, while you were working at the Louvre of Abu Dhabi? Well, thank you for the very interesting and, and complex questions, I must say. But uh, uh, very interestingly, in Abu Dhabi, you have to, 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 to remember that you had three big projects that have been launched all together at the same time, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, um, the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, and uh, Sheikh Zayed National Museum, who, which at the starting point was uh, curated by the British Museum. Yeah. So um, our Abu, Dhabi, uh, Abu Dhabi friends, you know, wanted the, uh, the best experience, to, you know, or knowledgeable, you know, team in the world for, to create those institutions. And at the beginning, you know, it was jokes between the three teams, the American one, the British one, and the French one, say, saying about this colonial past and we were mostly joking about our British friends because of course Abu Dhabi is a former British colony you know France is not part of, of history and, and all the uh, you know, America and um, but uh, we are, we're also joking between us because those are three different approaches you know of those multicultural questions you know and um, our British friends, I must say at the beginning, were very skeptical about the possibilities of adapting the French model, you know, in Abu Dhabi. So when, you know, I said to my British colleagues, you know, we're going to show nudity, this is what, what Louvre is about, French museums, we're all about, all about freedom, you know, uh, we have a distance from religion, you know, we are uh, in a society that separates uh, religion from, uh, you know, your uh, civic life, you know, this is a personal and private matter, so, and we're going to put this in Louvre, be <laughs> somehow, and they were just looking really completely crazy, and uh, so we had some very uh, interesting uh, conversation there, but, in the, I think in the end, what is interesting is that the only museum that is open today is a French one. I don't want to, you know, be, you know, too proud about it. But uh, at one point, I think that um, this strong political approach and public approach of our, you know, of, our, of, our, of what a museum is about, somehow 
um, convinced our uh, emirative friends that we were on the right track of building something that is a cultural dialogue. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to forget the French values or the traditional Arabic values. It's finding a common ground. It's like diplomacy. I mean, it's really cultural diplomacy. It's like trying to find a common ground where you can experience common, you know, a sort of common heritage coming from all over the world with different religious and cultural backgrounds and trying to create a narrative that is specific for Louvre Abu Dhabi. It is a universal museum. For instance, the, 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 the term universal is used in France and highly criticized all over the world saying that this is a colonial approach. But when we use universal, it means that all cultures and all religions are equal, you know, and that you shouldn't have a hierarchy between Western art and African art, you know, that you have to display all them together. It's exactly what we have done in the galleries of the Abu Dhabi. And somehow, um, you know, it, 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 it works. And I think that sometimes, I mean, works of art can go where politics cannot go, you know. You, you can have a dialogue there. And I really experienced it, you know, really directly. You can say things through works of art that would be impossible in the pure political diplomatic uh, conversation, you know, because it's a special place. It's a place where you can be free, you know, it's always this question of freedom, you know. It's a special place, a special space where things are possible, you know, and the whole thing about Hubba Abu Dhabi is was to protect this special place where you could experience something absolutely unique, you know. And of course, it's built on trust. You have to trust each other. You have to, you have to make compromise. It doesn't mean that you do not have to listen to adapt. And when this, somebody says, no, this is not possible because of this and that. Or if we said, you know, at one point we said for, for a few things, this is not possible. This is because this bears the name of a loop. You know, and there are certain things that would be unacceptable, you know, uh, for, you know, for the, in a place that bears the name of Lou. But, you know, you, 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 can, um, you can manage. And I think that uh, somehow it's, it's quite a, an encouraging sign, you know, that we've been very faithful to what we had in mind at the start of a project. It's exactly what you see today. Uh, there's, no, there's no difference there, I mean, somehow. So uh, it's interesting. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that response. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nuance. Um, I actually, it's it, because it's a sort of a similar in a similar vein of what we're talking about now. I want to pass the mic over to uh, John here at the rail. Mm -hmm. John, JC, if you'd like to. Hey, Laurence, thank you for this conversation. Um, my question is, perhaps oh, I just perhaps a little naive. Like I'm obviously not French, but. Um, Orsay is obviously very focused on French work. Um, mm -hmm. And since the 60s, the definition of French has become a little bit more complicated. Um, so my question is, is whether there's any consideration of expanding the museum's collection to reflect that like broadening definition of French to include, I don't know, art from places like overseas de departments like Guyon or like places that were French um, around the time that most of the work in the collection is from like Morocco, Algeria, places mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, no, it's, your question is interesting. Uh, yeah, we're about French art, but not only about French art. You know, from the start, the, the question of Orsay was also to testify, you know, of a much more global approach. Um, and you have a lot of works coming from different European countries, uh, from America, you know, and, 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 uh, the core of the collection is, is, is French because it's what the French state bought, you know, basically, and it's quite, it makes sense in a way. Um, but you're, you're very true, you have, to, you have to expand the notion of what was the French art scene in the 19th century. Um, and uh, uh, you're talking about special places, territories that were part of the colonial empire and became part of France. Um, it's true. Uh, I think it's also a question also, for instance, if you're talking about women, you know, it's also expanding uh, the collection uh, to women artists and to acknowledge also the place of women in 19th century art. 
And this, this has been a topic that we've been very working a lot, you know, say over the, the recent years. Um, and uh, with a whole new approach, also coming partly from America, but, but a lot only, uh, you know, uh, and it expands your, your, your vision of what the art scene has been at one point. You're, you're completely right. The fact is that we are dealing with the fine arts, you know, as it was defined, uh, you know, in, uh, in a former moment, you know, of art history. Uh, we're not, for instance, we, we are not the Kibonli, you know, so we, we do not show works, you know, I don't know, from Tahiti of the 19th century uh, directly or only in, in, in contemporary exhibition. We're not, you know, as comprehensive as that because, it, I mean, it, it would be impossible, but um, I, I really do think that you're right. You have to expand. What I say always to people is that um, history is never um, definitely written. It's rewritten all the time. And history of art is exactly the same. You know, it's, it is not, there's no absolute, there's no definitive version of it. You know, it's something very difficult to, um, to tell to an audience because when people enter a museum those large, impressive buildings, they tend to think that it's always been like that and that it's a sort of, uh, you know, truth that, that is forever like that. And something that I want to show is that it can change and that uh, it can change all the time and it's all right. I mean, it's all right. Um, we are doing the black model, but my successors will do other things and they will change and they will destroy probably what I'm doing right now, but that's part of it and that's very good, you know. And that there's nothing, uh, the way we read, the way we approach works of art changes all the time and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I mean, it's mm -hmm. perfectly okay. And so museums should reflect that. Of course, the difficulty is that an institution is quite a heavy, you know, <laughs> uh, vehicle and it's a huge ship and you cannot move everything as fast as you want. And that, that's, that's a pretty tough part of it, mm -hmm. obviously. Thank you very much. It's a very generous answer. Yes, thank you, JC and Louance. So we have time for just Two more questions. Uh, next, we are going to go to Jason Rosenfeld. Jason, I believe you can activate your mic now. Got it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Laurence. Um, I'm, I'm a art historian, mm -hmm. British art historian. I, the last time I was at the Orsay was with my colleague and friend, um, Tim Barringer. He and I had curated the um, show at Tate Britain, pre-Raphaelite's Victorian avant-garde. Mm, yes. We came and we saw the Renoir and Sun film show oh. uh, two Januarys ago. And we saw the Mucha show and the Knopf show, which were on at the same time. And of course, as historians of British art, uh, we were, you know, think there's not enough British art at the Musée d'Orsay. I kind, agree with you. It's you too expensive of, for it's us too now. Expensive. I think it's really interesting because you kind of just addressed it a little bit in your last answer. Um, you know, the, the Orsay founded as the compendium of French museums to cover 1848 to the First World War, yeah. basically, in Western art. But, you know, I, I feel like, I guess your challenge is very different from the challenge in America, where you had collectors who were buying art from all different countries, or even in Britain, where you had collectors who were ignoring British art because it made them look not cosmopolitan enough. So they were buying French work, they were buying Belgian work, and that's why that's in the National Gallery and then in Tate, modern. You know, so the challenge for you, I understand it, but how do you try to work around that to try to expand your collections beyond, you know, the one Burn Jones, um, the, yeah. the smattering yeah. of works, and to try to get some American art when there's not the same tradition in France of collecting works from abroad as there is in these other Western countries. No, no, it's, it's a challenge, you're perfectly right, because we are connected to the art market, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that happens in museum, and that's not the easy part for us, because in terms of uh, budgets and possibilities or acquisitions, there are things that might be now impossible for us to really change, you know, uh, buying a uh, major pre-Raphaelite work today is, is pretty tough for us, you know. Uh, I don't know what the art market would be, you know, after the crisis, but uh, there are definitely 
um, specialties and, and, and movements and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, but, but would be very tough to, to compensate in, in our collection. So, so we're exploring the margins also, which is very interesting because uh, in a way, modernity is always about uh, starting from the margin, going to the center. You know, that's the whole thing of the 19th century uh, avant-garde and, and, and birth of modernity. So it's interesting because we 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 bought, buying, for instance, Swiss paintings or um, you know uh, the Swedish painting. We bought a wonderful uh, Galen Kalela recently masterpiece from Galen Kalela. And uh, I'll say it's about that. We're going to have next year a show about Swiss painting in the late 19th century, which is a wonder. It's one of the most beautiful avant-garde of the late 19th century with an exploration of color, of light, which is, I mean, something extraordinary. But of course, French people do not know because we are being brought up, you know, with impressionism and uh, try to, and which, tend to ignore, you know, everything that has been going wrong. But if you're going to Russia, for instance, and I'm saying that to Joachim, there are wonderful, wonderful things to explore in Russian paintings. And we are quite poor in terms of Russian art also. Uh, so we try to, you know, we explore the art market all the time. I have very curious curators and we, we try. I mean, we, we are very active buyers, you know, until the crisis, but, uh, you know, uh, we used to be active buyers and we try to make addition to the collection to expand this vision. And we're, the other thing is that I was mentioned in the research center, we are starting this year a program of, of lectures and conference with a new school of history uh, researcher in France that are much more sensitive to global history. And, uh, trying to connect also things, you know, that were happening at the same time as the industrial revolution, you know, all around the world and trying to see how we can display um, also collection to, uh, in order to reflect also what was happening, you know, all around the world. And we're going to try a few things there. Uh, it's a bit of a laboratory thing, exploratory thing, but I think it's, uh, it's very interesting, very interesting, yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, certainly your, you know, changing exhibition slate reflects a, an openness to yeah. all different yeah. coming. That's the way they really come yeah. into the building. Absolutely. And then, and then you're great at making juxtapositions yes. with the permanent collection. No, very true. Very true. Thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Jason and Laurence. Our final question comes from the Rails' own Fong Bui. Fong, I believe you can turn on your mic. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Joachim. What a, an honest, frank, and enlightened conversation, which uh, reminded me not long ago when Max Holland, seen his name was mentioned, uh, who came to talk about what he's had able to do with the math. And at some point, Laurent, we talk, <laughs> we talk about the concept of um, you know, the, the small and, and large context, the, the, the idea of how, how a work of art can be placed, you know, either in the history of its own nation, which is referred as a small context, or in the supranational history of its art, mm -hmm. its lot nation. So we will talk <laughs> about how, um, for example, actually it came from Kundera, a terrific essay that were published in the New Yorker in the sometime in 2007, I think. It's called How We Read One Another. It's a terrific essay. But basically, there's a certain kind of issue between provincialism of the small nation versus the provincialism of large nation. It exists both, you know. In other words, you take, for example, uh, Rabelais, you know, Rabelais uh, was never really got appreciated in French, in France, but he was hugely popular in Russia mm -hmm. because of uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, you know, or Dostoevsky was less admired in Russia uh, than he was in France by Andre Gilles, for example. Uh, so it goes on and go on and go on. So that was, I think, to me, the difficult thing that we still readjusted. Yeah. And I think my question is very simple. Were, were you the one who hired Don Chien Kro 
to be the head of the contemporary uh, programming at the Museum d'Orsay. Mm -hmm. What? What? Uh, sorry, the question. Sorry. Was the one who who uh, uh, hire? Yes. 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 To be yes. the head of the. Yes, absolutely. I I I, um, uh, I am a great admirer of uh, Donatien's talent, and uh, it happened that you know at one point uh, he was in charge of the uh, Galerie Azedine Alaya in Paris, as you might know, in the exhibition that took place there. And you know, very sadly, um, uh, Azedine Alaya died, and uh, I immediately asked um, Donatien to join me at the Musée d'Orsay because I really wanted to launch those programs and I wanted this, uh, you know, the, 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 the talent, the openness, but also the historical accuracy, you know, the, the scholarly side also of Donatien, because uh, it's not only, you have to invite the right people to, to think that, you know, to, 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 uh, to sense that an artist could be interested by the collection or by a project, you know, this is quite a, a touchy, delicate thing. And uh, so I'm, uh, you know, I, I, we are very happy about this program, but I, that has changed the perception of Orsay also and brought a new audience also, a younger audience, you know, people who probably didn't come to Orsay before, um, you know, came for the Glenn Ligon installation, came for uh, what we did with Tracy Emin, for instance, last year also, and hopefully will come for Laurent Grasso and, and other great artists that are already working on projects with us, you know, and I think it's, um, well, it's, 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 it's what life is about, you know, meeting and encounters, you know. Yeah, thank you. What the world's getting smaller, and I must admit, I must confess that Donia Chiang, also one of the editor at large at the rail, so it's getting smaller. Yeah, small, small world, small <laughs> world, definitely, small world. Insular, I, I am afraid to say. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. It's a, a distant uh, relation. Uh, <laughs> Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Laurence. Thank you, Joaquin. Thank you so much. This is thank you, Laurence. Thank you. Wonderful conversation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your questions and to all of those that shared questions we didn't have time to get to. Um, before, well, the rail has a tradition at the end of our conversations with, by ending with a poetry reading. Um, we are thrilled to welcome the poet Isa Guzman to the stage today. Isa is a poet and recent Brooklyn College MFA graduate from Los Sures, Brooklyn, dedicating their work to the hardship, traumas, and political struggle within the Boricua diaspora. And apologies if I mispronounced that. Uh, Isa helps lead several projects, including the Titere Poets Collective, the PanCon Titere's podcast, La Esquina Open Mic, and La Cochina Workshop. Uh, we'll post a little more bio info in the chat for Isa, but Isa, I will hand the mic over to you now. Uh, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful discussion and I am so proud to be reading at the end of it. Um, first, thank you Brooklyn Rail for inviting me. Um, I wanna read two pieces. Uh, my first piece, I wanted to do something for the reading, uh, something for the conversation in terms of museums. And I was thinking about my own experience with museums. And one of my favorite pieces um, is actually in the Louvre, in the Louvre, um, which I saw at the Met, but it was an older, older copy of it or something. And um, it is uh, Sleeping Hermaphroditus. Uh, when I saw the sculpture, it struck me and it struck my identity. I, I identify now as a trans person. I've been transitioning for a year now. And so I want to read that that acrostic poem to be the first poem. The title is Hermaphrodito, Hermaphrodita, Durmiente, or Awakening Storm, Guavance. One, from her fragmented bed, she sleeps, ancient. Ancient dust particles linger on the stump of her left leg, lingers the chips across her marble flesh, smooth flesh of lusty water and time-painted marble, her hair, engendered curls of sea foam. Time has soaked her lovely limbs, back, thighs, culo. 
My thoughts roam her strange rivers, unconscious, unconsciously clear, surprised, and almost green. Her imperfections perfect as dream. Merge me into her scraps of cloth, her pieces of pillow. Give me a piece to dress in. Two. Or, dame me tormentas, hurucans mi brazos, destroya todas las costas, con mi imagen, imágeme en una traje de mal. Name me guaban sex, awake, fully mujer, fully becoming, en el poder de los ríos, una indonación de language, y breasts, y manos. From the dream suspended, buscas or encuentras her, a body attainable, realizable, real as the sea, mirando al cielo y sus distinta ilimitada. My second piece I want to recite is a piece in tribute to um, a trans woman who recently left us. Um, I take this poem as a form from Aracelis Gourmet, and another amazing poet. Um, the night poems are a sense of a, are a form in terms of tribute to someone who has fallen victim to some sort of social violence. In this case, uh, Eli Che was a black uh, trans woman who came from England because she couldn't find her treatment um, in England and she came to New York. Um, unfortunately, she died, of a, she died of a tragic drowning. Night for Eli Che. Eli Che. April 10th, 1997 to 2020. Did not die at the ripe age of 35, but was swept by Atabe's waves at 23. Will be embraced by Yemaya on August 31st who kept the earthly pearl of her life and made her infinite too soon. While well, Ellie likely thought about next month's friend or how much the next procedure would be or what grief or elation to process as her body changes into herself and is right now submerged in happenings yesterday. What happened tomorrow? What will happen now under and above the night her face joins the faces of Alexa, Dustin Parker, Jampi Ohroyo, Imanaka Diamond, Ilexi, Johanna Metzger, Iserina Ramos, Ilela Sanchez, I Penelope Ramirez, I Nina Pop, I Heli J, I Tony McDabe, I Remy Fells, I Ryan Milton, I Re uh, Renee Thompson, I Selena Reyes Hernandez, I Brian Powers, I Brayla Stone, I Mercy Mack, I Shaki Peters, I Bree Black, I Summer Taylor, I Merlin uh, Caraces, I, Dor I Dior Ova, I Kanisha Hardy, I Aja Ron Spears, I all the nameless others this year has claimed or will claim. And Ellie, you own the night in all its waveform cartilage and dream space light. You own the night knowing thyself, and you are still becoming. You are still becoming. Thank you so much. Um, just a note to end on, all Black Lives Matter, all trans Black Lives Matter. Um, thank you so much for having me again. Um, yeah. Lisa, thank you so much. That was a perfect reading to end this conversation. And uh, we're very grateful for, for you being here today. Uh, once again, thank you, Laurence. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Joaquim. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we have these conversations every day at 1 p.m. Please join us on Monday for a conversation on Philip Gustin with Musa Mayer, Sally Raddick, and our own Fong Bui. Uh, now, as we all depart, please feel free to unmute or activate your microphones to say hello or goodbye, and I wish you all a beautiful weekend. Thank you so much. The woman I didn't realize is that Thank she you. was- Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, everyone. This was phenomenal.
Thank Thanks, you. Helen and Joaquim. Thanks, Merci Helen. Thank, you, Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> yeah, Nick. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> yeah, Nick, way to go. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. French art behind him, too. Thank I you. loved your poems, Isa. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Isa. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for you. tuning in, as always. Thank you, Fun. Thank you. Oh, that's terrific. I have a have a great, great weekend, conversation. Everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Have a great. Bye-bye. 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 B